by the time we have the attendees coming in for the seminar, we have a brief introduction to the technical inputs of this session. At the outset, a very good afternoon to all the guests and participants, and a very warm welcome to the 13th edition of Aero India, the runway to the billion opportunities. This is the first hybrid air show being hosted at Bengaluru. I am Mrs. Neena Singh, General Manager HR BEML Limited, as your host for this session. Before we commence the seminar, all the guests and dignitaries are kindly requested to settle down, keep their mobile phones in switch off or silent mode to avoid any obstruction in the flow of communication. I'll call on the speakers to come on the dais. We have a plethora of eminent speakers for this session. May I call upon Toby Simon, who is the founding president of Synergia Foundation, a strategic affair think tank based in Bengaluru that deals with geoeconomics and geopolitical issues. Lieutenant General Raj Shukla, YSM, SM, GOC in C, R track. Lieutenant General Shukla's career in the Indian Army spans four decades and the last year assumed command of the Army Training Command. Amongst his posting, Sir was the commandant of the Indian Army's training establishment and think tank, the Army War College. May I now invite Sri Sanjay Mitraji, who is retired IAS of 1982 batch, a senior officer of West Bengal cadre. He has served as the Defense Secretary of India and the Chief Secretary of West Bengal. He also served as the Acting Chairperson of the Defense Research and Development Organization and as a consultant to the United Nations Development Program. May I now invite Air Marshal Anil Kosla, PVSM, AVSM, VM, ADC, former Vice Chancellor of the Air Staff, Vice Chief of the Air Staff, sorry. He was commissioned in the fighter stream of the Indian Air Force in 1979 and has more than 4,000 hours of accident-free flying, mainly on Jaguar, MiG-21, and Kiran aircrafts. He is a postgraduate from the Defense Service Staff College and holds two MPhil degrees in military studies. Welcome, sir. May I now invite Sri Subhash Chandra, sir, a 1986 batch retired IS officer of the Karnataka cadre. He was the Secretary of Defense Production at the Ministry of Defense, and in earlier stint, he was the Joint Secretary, Army. May I now call upon Sri Samir Joshi, who is a former squadron leader of the Indian Air Force, he is currently the director of New Space Research and Technologies in one, of, in one of the leaders in the development of drone technologies. Welcome, sir. Dr. Joseph Felter works for the Center for International Security and Cooperation and the Hoover Institute. From 2017 to 2019, Felter served as U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South Asia, Southeast Asia, 
and Oceania. Welcome, sir. Thank you. We have. The conflicts, be it due to economic compulsions, trade rivalries, shrinking resources, demographic pressures, climatic change, political upheavals, religious radicalization, etc., are the risks that may fuel the future conflicts. Surrounded by friends and foes, India will continue to face the myriad risk of its security. Synergia Foundation has focused on staying ahead of the curve and its session titled Future of Conflicts at the Aero India 2021. This session will aim to keep the manufacturers and defense establishments this in India prepared for the times to come. The session will bring together the finest thinkers from the defense establishment, including high-ranking serving and former officers and key decision makers from the industry. To deliberate upon the subject, I hand over to Mr. So uh, Toby Simon, who is the moderator for the session for the panel discussion. Sir, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. For, let me first of all apologize that we are delayed. Uh, it was due to un inevitable uh, causes. Uh, so uh, I, I would be very brief in making these opening remarks. Uh, as a think tank, we have been looking at conflicts since 2012, both traditional and non-traditional. And so we went from uh, hybrid warfares to network warfares to optimal warfares, just to see how uh, conflicts have metamorphed in the last 10 years. And we felt there's a significant amount of change that is happening in a post-COVID world, especially in this part of Asia. So we thought it was extremely important to have some of the brightest minds to come and think about it, both from here and around. And today we have uh, some exceptionally bright speakers. And I don't want to take much time. Let me first uh, uh, welcome uh, Lieutenant General Raj Shukla to give uh, his opening keynote. I just want to say that as of now, we have about 1,400 people uh, watching us uh, on, on uh, uh, digitally. So we may have a le less number of people here, but we have a lot of people watching us from around. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Toby Simon, President Synergia Foundation, the very distinguished panelists, uh, Shri Sanjay Mitra, former Defense Secretary, Air Marshal Kosla, former Vice Chief of the Air Staff, Sri Shubhash Chandra, Squad Leader Samit Joshi, Joseph, Dr. Joseph Felter, and I'm told uh, Sri Sanjay Jaju also will be here. So ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Thank you, Synergia, for the invite and the opportunity to share my thoughts on this very exciting subject about the future of conflict. It's always a hazardous a prospect to guess estimate the futures, but very critical in my view. Because if you can get the futures right, the effort of your statecraft is that much more optimized. We will never get the futures 100% right, but efforts like these will make sure that we don't get them 100% wrong either. And the more you anticipate, the less you will need to improvise when you face the crisis. So the looking at futures is always a good idea, and I really look forward to the discussion. Well, a reasonable estimate of strategic military futures, in my view, could be arrived at through a careful evaluation of two factors. The likely trends, trajectories, and geopolitical contestation is one, and a distilled assessment of the breakthrough disruptive technologies that are impacting war fighting. Insofar as the first issue is concerned, I don't need to remind uh, this audience, both the, the physical participants and those online, that after a brief holiday, post the Cold War, geopolitics is well and truly back. And it has got particularly accentuated in the post-pandemic world. Technologies, I don't think in the recent past or recent uh, periods in history, 
have technologies had such a great changing impact on war fighting as is currently the case. So when you intersect these two factors and arrive at a grounded projection into the futures and not a set of fantasies of science fiction, and if you further extrapolate it to the Indian strategic context, you should get a fair idea of the likely conflict scenarios and the kind of capacities in defense that we will need to create, build, and nurture. So let me, in the course of my next 15 odd minutes, try and do precisely that. I'll assess trends in geopolitical contestation ever so briefly, get a fix on our techno-military futures, and then try and arrive at likely conflict scenarios in the Indian context, and what should we precisely do? So geopolitical contestation first. Well, while there could be many benign scenarios as well, let me, for the purpose of this discussion, focus on the hard ball in international relations and the inexorable logic of some of the key postulates of the doctrine of balance of power. Well, the hard ball tells us that the foremost contest in the years to come will be between the USA and China in terms of either preserving, circumscribing, or expanding their respective freedoms to roam the globe. Such a contest will, of course, have numerous textures and subtexts in diplomacy, in trade, in economies, in terms of access to microchips, rare earths, other minerals, foodstuffs, and their flows, the partnerships and countervailing coalitions, etc., etc. But essentially, it will be one with regard to preservation and expansion of spheres of influence. Similar contests will ensue in the regional context as well. For the realists in IR tell us that there can be in one region only one regional hegemon and no peer competitor. Many examples from history reinforce the proposition. So we shall continue to see these contests in the regional context, Saudi Arabia, Iran, China, Japan, and similar other examples in different regions of the world. But the most interesting and critical of these contests will be the one in the Asian continent, where for perhaps the first time in history, you have two consequential powers, the world's number one and number three economies in PPP terms, growing in close proximity in the absence of historical buffers. A modest vivendi between the two can of course be found, but there is the equal possibility of their geostrategic spaces intersecting, if not clashing. We need to work diligently in search of the former, a peaceful, modest vivendi, but be as vigilant and prepared for the latter. The contestation that I referred to will play out essentially in two spheres, competition and kinetic conflict. Militaries of the future will need to be as adept in prevailing in the strategic military competition as in the dynamic of full-fledged con kinetic conflict. Now, this is a postulate that we must very carefully consider. Allow me to elaborate, explain this with a cricketing analogy here. There was a time when five-day test cricket, it was said, was the only real stuff. All the other formats, one-day cricket, T20, the day and night extravaganzas, were more entertaining, they were money spinners, but they were looked down upon as not quite the real stuff. That has changed greatly. Chiteshwar Pujara is, of course, important, but a street-smart Natarajan, a skilled exponent of all the formats in the game, is fetid as much. Similarly, the days of real militaries doing only full-fledged kinetic conflict are over. That, of course, remains our primary purpose, but we must be as proficient in the other formats of gray zone combat and conflict. If we are to remain strategically balanced and relevant, proficiencies in the latter will perhaps be even more critical. Adversaries will probe you in the contest to find weaknesses that could be exploited in the kinetic conflict. This is something that militaries, particularly the Indian military, must very carefully consider. In consequence, or as a corollary, hard power in the instrument of force. In their many shades and manifestations, deterrence, show of force, political military signaling, will or should become more and more central to the strategic orientation, thinking, and outlook of nations. If they have to acquire ascendancy, especially in the competition space that I referred to. Here are some of the examples of intensifying competition. Not many years back, we had Russian Su-27 aircraft doing barrel rolls within 25 feet 
of an American RC-135 reconnaissance plane in, the, plane in the Baltic. The USS Donald Cook was overflown more than 30 times by a pair of Su-27 fighters on one, one occasion as close as 30 feet. Numerous examples in the South China Sea. You have Chinese Coast Guard ships, 12,000-ton behemoths, the size of a modern destroyer, which can sink a 5,000-ton ship to the floor. Ostensibly, these vessels are for coastal security. In reality, they are tools of maritime coercion. The Chinese Coast Guard, now I'm told, has been given orders to open fire. And there are numerous other inc incidents at sea in the South China Sea. We had the Liaoning incident, the USS Tidam in the South China Sea, all reflective of growing gamesmanship and risk escalation and control. The IOR in the years to come in, may develop into such a playground for contest and contestation. We must be prepared in anticipation. Far greater osmosis, therefore, will therefore be needed between defense and diplomacy. That will, in fact, in my view, be become the defining leitmotif in the years to come. Political warfare will also grow in salience. Political warfare, is, after all, is the logical application of the Clausewitz doctrine in times of peace. So employment of all means, violence, economic, soft, uh, soft power, trade, public diplomacy, imaging ideas, deep fakes, controlling of narratives to achieve national objectives or gain strategic ascendancy will become the norm. Examples of political warfare are these Western sanctions, driving inflation, causing a drop in real incomes, sinking the ruble in Russia, causing the Russians to spend more than 50% of their income simply on buying food. The Chinese aggression in the South China Sea has a strong strategic rationale, but it is also about access to marine resources because the prices of proteins are skyrocketing. So we will need to draw a similar deduction in our case. The point to make is this, that nations that seek to or abide by the purest ideals in civil military relations, with the military and politics operating in distinct silos, will tend to trail in the strategic military competition. So in the Indian context, we need to draw a subtle distinction between the apolitical nature of militaries, which is a sine qua non, and their use as effective tools in political warfare. Techno-military futures. Well, the game-changing impact of the convergence of disruptive technologies on war fighting in general, and now even the physical fight, the company squadron battles in particular, is not only apparent, but perhaps stark. There are a bouquet of growing technologies within finite, infinite possibilities in the military sphere. Many of them have already got kicking. All of them almost have great potential in the future. So very sh shortly along the northern borders, we should have a military IoT, which will lie at the convergence of AI, big data, and 5G. Advances in blockchain will, will transfer the advantage in cyber warfare from offense to defense. In quantum, you have a host of applications, radar, radars, for example, for the detection of stealth aircraft, hack-proof communications, quantum navigation, imaging, and so on. 3D, 4D printing, many applications in space and cyber, blockchain, AR, VR, uh, autonomous systems, directed energy platforms, rail guns, and all of these are being worked on in some form, even in India at this moment, as we speak. Hypersonics, where the speed of the ballistic missile and maneuverability of the cruise missile uh, give you great effect on target. In fact, on account of sheer velocity, a hypersonic missile can deliver 10 times that of conventional tonnage. So salience of rare earths in digital combat, because very soon militaries will have to transit from industrial era war fighting to digital era combat. In fact, I think in the Indian context, it's already late. So all these things are going to happen. But apart from the technologies, we'll have to usher in a novel culture an enabling ecosystem. Some of that is happening and some of need that needs to pick up pace and momentum. Technologies alone will not do. We'll have to usher in a culture of military enterprise and innovation. Agile bureaucracies. Even as Western democracies were consumed by the processes, China took great advantage and make sure that while they were, the Western democracies were consumed by processes, Chinese technologies blossomed and bloomed. We'll need to fund failures invest far greater in R&D. The US, I am told, combined in the private and governmental spheres, put in about $200 billion every year in, 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 in defense-related R&D. 
And I think today the point is that R&D has to come from both spheres because in all these uh, domains of technology, every commercial, uh, or shall I say, in every technology, if you do well in the commercial space, there are national military spin-offs and the other way around. If you do well in the military space, there are commercial spin-offs. So it's in the interest of both the private sector and the government to invest far greater in R&D. The other issue is civil military fusion. There has to be civil military fusion if we have to really harness these technologies. China is a good example to emulate. China has launched a global hunt for talent. Here are two examples. Some eight years back, they pick up a young Chinese scientist called Professor Jian V. Pan. He's sent to Heidelberg University under the best name in quantum, Anton Zelliger. Four years later, he returns and designs the first quantum satellite for China. He's now working on the quantum radar. So this is the kind of global hunt for talent that will have to be done. Last year, the Chinese Academy of Military Engineering got in 57 overseas scientists, including the brightest minds from the US Los Alamos University. So these are all the steps that we will have to take in the Indian context. Some have started, but we have a long way to go. The impact of disruptive technologies is not only visible on the character of war, but also on the combined arms balance. We've seen how offensive drone operations have challenged the traditional prima donors of combat. Our aerial platforms, the tanks, artillery, dug and infantry, air defense systems. There was a time when doctrines fueled techno technological growth. Today, technologies are driving doctrinal cycles. The Apple One iPad today has the same processing power that was available in a defense lab perhaps 10 years back. The autonomous drone can self-correct 400 times in a second. Another good example of technology is that I'm told sometimes around 2007-8, the very powerful Americans had two predators in Afghanistan. One was armed and the other unarmed. And they had 200 ground sources. So the ratio was two, is to 200. Today the ratios are reversed. There are 200 drones and perhaps 20 ground sources. So this is how technology is changing. Technologies are making unequals on the battlefield equal. The Aramco oil strikes in September 2019 Good example, where you had a country under sanctions getting together with the Houthis and penetrating some of the most sophisticated AD systems, uh, Skyguard, Krotal, even bypassing the US Fifth Fleet. So this is what technology, is, I mean, impact is already um, quite visible. Over the next de decade, military worldwide will need to transform in outlook structures and capacities from industrial era competencies to digital era proficiencies. We have to do it in the Indian context because the future may well be about algorithmic warfare, which is in a, sense about, in a sense is about capacities in designing the smartest and most adaptive algorithms. It is about prowess in cloud technologies and why should India do that? We have some of the best minds in software, lowest data development costs, and the manner in which networks are configured and operate. So today's networks have been overwhelmed by big data's three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety they will have trouble turning data into useful intelligence. So the battlefield picture will become that much poorer. The newer networks based on these deep learning machines, neural networks trained with big data sets will speed up the operations of the grid against high-speed cyber, electronic warfare, and space architecture attacks. So if you have missiles coming to you at max six speeds, the only response can be from learning machines. Of course, if learning machines these digital responses are optimized with humans, you will get what we call human machine teaming. So that's the way forward. Militaries the world over are investing greatly today in strong anti-access bubbles built on the strength of long range vectors, precision navigation and timing systems, hypersonics and strategic air defense. This is also a reality in the Sino-Indian context. I suspect that trend will continue and acquire greater momentum. In consequence, there are newer challenges New contests will be spawned. The deployment and projection of military power today itself is becoming an, an issue. We'll need to develop new technologies, war fighting philosophies to break the bubble, both in the Sino-Indian context and in the larger sense globally. Now, um, in the end, let me come to some specific challenges in the Indian strategic context. They, of course, flow from what I have said so far. So what are the challenges in our, the Indian strategic context? especially so in terms of the emerging contours of future conflict, and therefore, what should we do? One, we need to brace up very significantly for concurrent threats. 
a possible strategic squeeze of sorts, both in the continental, the northern borders, and the maritime, the IOR domains. Even as we rebalance to the north on land, we must turn aggressively to the seas, a huge challenge in an era of finite budgets. We will need to optimize, get very smart and agile, joint and integrated, if we are to address, in my view, this inevitable strategic squeeze in the years and decades to come. Two, we need to turn digital quickly and in a very big way. Military capacities in the future will not be about building the biggest tanks, guns, and aircraft alone. Investments, proficiencies, and soft capital will be just as significant. So smart algorithms, combat apps, new age skills, a new ecosystem with agile bureaucracies as critical. How do we evolve into a space force? The wisdom with which we exploit opportunities in cyber. These are all here and now challenges which are confronting the Indian military. We'll need to embrace multi-domain operations capacities conceptually and structurally, especially in terms of three key postulates. Mastery of the traditional domains of land, air, and sea will no longer suffice. We will need to upgrade our capacities significantly in the newer domains. Space, cyber, the electromagnetic spectrum, the autonomous weapon platforms in the tenets of algorithmic warfare. We will need to shell the classical war and peace disposition and enhance cross-governmental fusion in order to win aggressively in the competitive space. A few years from now, in a typical MDO engagement, so a combat group assaulting enemy dispositions will be enabled by multiple capacities across domains. So a high space UAV system or investments in low orbit technologies will provide the combat group commander with complete transparency of the enemy battle speeds through real time persistent surveillance. This could be complemented by a Su-30 reconnaissance mission hours earlier with the imagery of key enemy dispositions offloaded into a tri-service cloud for instant re retrieval and target de de designation by the staff in the combat command headquarters. A cyber strike in terms of digital ones and zeros as part of spoof attacks or preparatory bombardment will disable the enemy radars, command and control apparatus, and electronic warfare systems. Having achieved such complete mastery over the battle space in terms of visual transparency is also domination of the electromagnetic spectrum that kinetics will now be unleashed. As the traditional fire and maneuver elements of the combat group launch the physical assaults, a swarm of offensive drones based on autonomous AI-enabled edge computing and distributed intelligence could project 30 kilometers in depth to neutralize the enemy mechanized columns that are moving in for a counterattack. Through such smart convergence and the innovative bundling of technologies across multiple domains, a futuristic MDO-enabled combat group will achieve its mission with surgical precision in compressed time frames and at fractional costs. So MDO capacities will thus enhance our combat proficiencies by a significant order of magnitude. For much of what I have said, going digital, the MDO orientation cannot happen unless we invest heavily into these disruptive technologies and their convergence in a big way. So Atmanir Bharta in disruptive technologies of the future will be critical. Not only frontier technology systems in AI and algorithmic warfare, but in the logistic supply chain. Smart power management systems, for example. Not a vehicle, eight vehicle chain of generators to power an electronic warfare system, but possibly one, only one or two. The architecture routing of these supply chains will just be as critical to ward off possible geopolitical disruptions. That was the biggest lesson from the recent pandemic. Five, we will have to embrace these disruptive technologies. If we have to embrace these disruptive technologies, sorry, the spend of defense R&D will have to be scaled up very, very significantly, as I said. And whether such investment is channeled through the private sector space or the defense space really does not matter. Commercial technologies will have military spin-offs, as I said, uh, on the commercial space and vice versa. Six, yet another challenge, one that has already begun to manifest but will extend significantly into the future will be our ability to penetrate the anti-excess bubble, the stand of deterrence capacities of the adversary. There are very significant challenges here in terms of our developing suitable responses to adversary capacities in long range precision fires, offensive cyber, hypersonics, electronic attacks, soft kill directed energy weapons, and strategic air defense systems. We need to think through this very carefully and with speed. I'm afraid we are not doing enough. Seven is the skill and sagacity with which we partner with like-minded allies as also add heft to our strategic partnerships and countervailing coalitions. This may be critical. 
We have seen what new age challenges are. Their scale and their magnitude are staggering. Concurrently, the legacy challenges like cross-border terrorism, terrorism have not quite, quite gone away. So the military burdens are only growing and they can be comprehensively addressed only through smart partnerships and sharing of geographical burdens, say, in the IOR. We will need to find innovative ways to add military heft to our partnerships, share assets and burdens, ensure greater interoperability. There should be greater imagination in our joint training regiments, pursue initiatives like the DTTI, the Defense Technology and Trade, with greater diligence and sense of purpose. The Lone Ranger syndrome will need to be suitably circumscribed and calibrated. It is simply no longer wise. And lastly, but perhaps most importantly, if we, are in, if we are to wade into the strategic military futures with any degree of success, our entire defense ecosystem, the military included, will need a cultural metamorphosis of sorts in terms of dynamic recruitment philosophies, talent management, talent retention, the spirit of investigation and inquiry, challenging assumptions, creativity, innovation, energy and enterprise. Now all this is a tall order. We have begun to make the change, but we need to accelerate the process greatly. With these thoughts, allow me to conclude. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Jai Hind. Uh, I would now invite Dr. Joe Felter uh, uh, to come and speak uh, virtually to us. He's been staying awake. He's in the West Coast. So if you could just ensure that the camera is switched on, then uh, with your permission, we'll give him the benefit to speak. Great. Th thanks very much, Toby. It's not too late out here in California, but uh, uh, it's a bit later than it is there in India. Uh, but again, it's, it's a real honor to join this, this auspicious panel, uh, if even virtually from, from here in California, just off Stanford campus. Um, but we'd like to say thank you to, thank you to, I don't know if I just started or, or if I missed that, but, but thanks, Toby, uh, and then Synergy for, for the invitation and this opportunity. Um, you know, I've had the pri privilege of getting to know a number uh, of the speakers joining this session personally. Uh, so Secretary Mitra, Secretary Chandra, uh, Secretary Sanjay Jaju, I, it's, I'm just thrilled to share a screen with you uh, today and I just have such great respect for you and the, the other distinguished members of, of this panel. Um, and I hope that I'm coming through. If, if I'm not, just give me give me the flag there, uh, Toby. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I attended Aero India in, in 2019 in Bangalore and boy, the world sure has changed. Uh, so I'm just wishing all joining today good health and, and best wishes as we turn the corner together on these challenging times. Um, so the topic of the panel, uh, you know, the future of conflict. Uh, so, you know, I would argue free countries with open systems that nurture creativity and innovation, you know, have a potentially comparative advantage in preparing for and deterring future conflict. Uh, you know, you really can't steal creativity. Um, but leveraging this creativity and innovation potential, it's a national security imperative, and we need to tap our top talent and bring them to the table. Um, the reality is, though, that the top talent in the United States and, and certainly probably India and our other partners around the world um, you know, this town is less and less likely to support national security efforts. Uh, in, in the last century, you know, our best engineers and scientists, young and old, they were attracted to working for government labs and, and agencies like, like, like NASA or intelligence agencies. You know, this is where the cutting edge technology was developed. But boy, today our best engineers, computer scientists and other technical expertise, such as at Stanford and the IITs uh, and other top universities, they're flocking to pursue more lucrative options. You know, they're going to places like Google, Facebook, and other commercial companies. You know, this is where today's cutting edge tech technology advances are occurring, you know, in areas like AI, autonomy, and cyber, quantum, and so many other fields. Uh, but the military must identify and deploy these technologies at speed in order to compete successfully in this century. Um, so what can we do to help make sure that our best and brightest have the opportunity to work on important national security problems and, and contribute their skills? You know, short of joining defense and, and government. You know, how, can, how, how can we enlist the support of, of this largely untapped pool of expertise to help identify technology solutions to defense challenges that, that increasingly originate in the commercial uh, technology base? So in my presentation, uh, you know, I'd like to describe an initiative that aims to do exactly this. It's called Hacking for Defense. It, it's a defense innovation education program that aims to harness the talents and expertise of our younger generation and provide them these, these important opportunities to work with the military uh, 
and military relevant emerging technologies and, and, and help our Defense Department and other government agencies, agencies address their most pressing challenges. Uh, again, we developed and piloted this course uh, here at Stanford, and it's now taught at over 50 universities in the U.S. and uh, scaling to the U.K. and Australia. So if I could have a, I, I sent a slide ahead. I don't know if it's possible to show that that one slide and then, and then maybe a video, but uh, if you get to the slide, great. If not, I'll just keep going. But uh, um, talking about the class, um, it, it's a class, um, and we like to call it an innovation insurgency, though, across academia. And it starts with, with a real-world problem facing our Defense Department. Um, and we take these problems and, uh, you know, we, our, our team sources them within the defense and intelligence community. Uh, they curate them, we find them, and we get them down to a one-page problem statement. Um, these, these come from a variety of places, you know, all the services and, and addressing, uh, you know, a, a range of different technologies uh, in, in their solutions. And we, uh, we fall under a large umbrella of, of a defense organization now called the Defense Innovation Unit, which helps us curate these problems and match them to universities. Uh, the students form around these, these, these problems, they plot the class, and then they get to work. They take advantage of the lean methodologies. For those of you familiar with, with the startup community, you'll be familiar with this term. Um, but they conduct a process of what we call beneficiary discovery, where our students go out and conduct you know, multiple interviews every week during the course, so, you know, over 100 by, by the end of, of the, uh, the term. Um, and they develop, you know, basically it's the scientific method for entrepreneurship applied to defense challenges. They, they develop and test hypotheses on what a solution this defense problem might look like. They validate or invalidate this, this hypothesis through a discovery process. They build minimum viable products, and then they continue to iterate and iterate and get more data and get more discovery. And by the end of the course, they present them to their problem sponsors, their, their, their minimum viable products. And, and boy, it's just incredible the progress that these brilliant young, young men and women uh, are able to, to make in, in such a short time. And, and some of these solutions, you know, they're adopted outright by, by their military sponsors. Um, and certainly every sponsor learns a lot more about their problem at a minimum. A lot of these, these student teams uh, form companies and continue to work on these challenges. Uh, we help them avail of a dual use uh, technology accelerators and uh, non-diluted capital, other, other, other government sources of income uh, connected with investors. Some of our teams have gotten literally tens of millions of dollars of, of investment and, and now become programs of record in our military. So it's, it's really extraordinary. Um, and I'm going to ask if I could uh, just, if you could hear some of the feedback from uh, from the, the students uh, in, in a video. And I, I, I sent this ahead of time. So, uh, uh, Toby, I wonder if you could play that video now. And I'll give you a second if, if, if you can tee that up. It's a way to contribute meaningfully. Um, and, and we hope that students will look at hacking defense as that public service opportunity. We have created an opportunity for some of the best and brightest millennials in the country to actually perform a, a national service in, in providing a solution to problems without actually having to change their entire life and their career to work on it. Oftentimes in Silicon Valley, it's really easy not to think about engineering skills as something for social good, and oftentimes just something for profit. Um, and this course really is a fantastic opportunity for students to think about an alternative path. You can do a lot of things, especially as an engineer at Stanford, there's so many doors, but how many doors do you have that'll literally save people's lives? Most people will never get this opportunity to have such breadth and depth into a system that typically is closed to outsiders. Thinking about how the fast iteration processes that entrepreneurship really holds dear can be also applied to national security strategies was a new way of thinking in national security that I hadn't really thought about before. I think the big thing I got out of this class was understanding Steve Blank's customer discovery model. Uh, learning lean methodologies, uh, learning how to get out of the building, learning uh, entrepreneurial mindset, which is a shorthand for how to operate under chaos, confusion, and insufficient data. The technological needs of national security are incredibly big. Uh, there's a chance here to use the lean startup methods to connect students and others to solving them. The solutions that the students came up with were, they were incredible. Um, they, uh, some of them are practical, we could put the use today. Uh, some required a little more development, but all of them leverage the best of what our commercial industry can provide. I think there was a lot of value that the students derived from being able to apply sort of classroom learning to real world problems. We had great mentors from the Hoover Institution help us along. Our sponsor has been a great help. 
I think we were just really impressed by how thoughtful and um, how eager these people are to uh, develop innovative solutions. This is probably the toughest class you're going to take at Stanford. And you know, it was a privilege to be chosen for the class in the first place. And yeah, it was absolutely worth it. I would do it again. You know, there are definitely ups and downs, but yeah, I'm glad I did it. All right, well, thank you. I, I, till we all conclude, I know I'm getting to the end of my time. Um, but I would say, you know, when it comes to preparing for and prevailing in future conflict, we can't afford not to harness the creativity and ingenuity of our best and brightest young people and provide them an opportunity to serve by applying these talents, you know, to address these pressing defense and national security challenges. Um, and, you know, we know that there are amazingly talented students at every level in India. Um, many of the best students in our course are from India. So huge potential in India for, for this program. And I know my friend, uh, 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 Secretary Sanjay Jaji was leading the way in, here in India with IDEX and other programs. Um, and so as you know, Secretary Mitra, Secretary Chandra, Secretary Kumar, you know, they, they made so many important contributions uh, in this field while, while in their service. Um, but our team at Stanford, well, we're happy to be a resource for India as it builds its defense innovation ecosystem in you know, any way we could be helpful. Uh, but, but Toby, thank you again for the chance to join. Uh, please, everyone, stay well. And I hope I can see some of my friends and colleagues in India again very soon when, uh, when we can travel. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you for staying awake and, and giving this very insightful talk. Uh, we hope to welcome you to India again. So let me just now invite uh, Mr. Subhash Chandra uh, to share his thoughts on the future of conflicts. Well, let me begin by just thanking Synergia Foundation and Toby for inviting me here. Uh, the foundation has been associated with the ministry and events such as these, uh, like Def Expo and Aero India, and it's wonderful to see many old friends uh, in today's events. Now, what strategizing for the sector f for future conflicts, I think we must remember that all militaries need to prepare for new wars not essentially fight the last one better. And therefore, technology and innovation, as has been outlined also by General Shukla, uh, will continue to determine the victors and the vanquished, as it has always been the case. But from an aerospace and defense production standpoint, technology needs to be planned for and not acquired incidentally. <coughs> And this requires a fair amount of strategizing to shape the entire design, development, and manufacturing ecosystem. The received wisdom currently is that future conflicts will be short, swift, technologically challenging for conventional weapon systems and of intense lethal impact. In a way, this was also the rationale for TNT and nuclear armaments. But today, the strategic option is held as a deterrence, and the boundaries of other weapon systems and technology are pursued. But before that, a strategy for aerospace and defense production is essential. So from field guns to T-90 tanks, frigates and submarines, Su-30, ALH, and now the LCA, and hopefully the LCH, defense production in India uh, I think pretty much covers a very wide spectrum. But are we at the cutting edge in aerospace and defense? We talk today of indigenous production or Atmanirbhar Bharat, but the larger issue is how to orient the defense manufacturing sector for future conflicts and for those that will require different technologies. Now, it is unlikely that India will be engaged in expeditionary wars. Its focus will be the western and the northern neighbors, but it must be prepared to protect its territories and interests in the Indian Ocean region and across all domains of conflict. So the challenges for defense manufacturing in the A&D sector will include, to my mind, choosing between 
the development or acquiring of technology, choosing between the assembly and collaboration and co-production of platforms, creating a manufacturing base with industry to enable outsourcing of assemblies and sub-assemblies, safeguarding technologies and sharing with ideological allies and military partners, scaling production facilities through skilling, testing, certification, and field support, and finding funds for these modernized weapon systems. In many ways, this has also been the approach so far. But for future conflicts, the strategy would require an urgency and focus. And this could include uh, some of the, the thoughts that I felt are uh, <coughs> important for this sector. We need to identify the possible contours of conflict and then identify key weapon systems and technologies for the armed forces. Drones and artificial intelligence are obvious examples, but this has to be led by the military and supported, of course, by the DRDO. We need to utilize domestic capabilities more effectively and compress timelines from prototypes to induction. Because when we talk about swift wars, we should also remember that uh, the acquisition of technologies will also be that much faster for the likely opponents. Leveraging of international cooperation to gain access to technologies and product development. Agreements and existing fora such as foundational agreements, industrial security, annex, etc., also come to mind in this context. We need to use offsets to bring in technology and technology partners, an option that has, uh, has been cited very often is the South Korean exam experience. Recent changes at the policy level with higher multipliers for technology transfer in the offset policy are intended to do this. And then we need to find funds and innovative means of co-production. Uh, examples in India include the approach with Brahmos and the recent Kalashnikov rifle manufacturing, uh, <coughs> which has also been initiated. So for future conflicts, the A&D sector in India should focus on key technologies and production of items such as aero engines and also strategic materials, space technologies and communications, satellite imagery and geospatial data interpretation, scaling up of available defense technologies to create the defense technology hubs that will integrate elements of 4IR, IR and manufacturing and lighthouse technologies. I think we in a place like Bangalore, we need to move beyond uh, industrial corridors and look at the creation of technology hubs for the A&D sector. Uh, fast tracking of the FDI policy through further simplification of the industrial licensing system to facilitate ease of doing business, including security clearances. These have usually taken a lot of time. The prototyping of products through testing, certification, including self-certification and quality assurance needs to be made more accessible and expeditious as more industries and startups are expected to be associated with the process. Association of other departments or ministries such as the Directorate General of Foreign Trade, the Ministry of Commerce, the National Skill Development Corporation, under the Ministry of Skill Development would also help to create the technical uh, expertise pool which can help in this, in this direction. Outsourcing of components from domestic private firms will uh, have to be you know, taken up uh, <coughs> on priority. The, the Tejas Mark I uh, example is uh, 
is something which is very live uh, here today. But we must look at some of the other uh, impending approvals that are awaited. The light combat helicopter, for instance, hopefully the C-295 transport aircraft. Uh, we must identify some of the sectors that we need to focus on and then have sectoral roadmaps for these sectors. Uh, UAVs, drones, swarms all present a new vector. And Aero India, Aero India 2019, uh, 2019 had an emphasis on, on the UAVs through the drone Olympics, the startup day, the technology, etc. But the application of AI in drones will need a close interface with the services to drive and integrate the technologies and to bring them into an affordable uh, you know, price range in, for induction. I think MOD should also boost uh, the confidence in this area by bringing about uh, a status report on its 2019 report on artificial intelligence in defense manufacturing. Uh, we had this report uh, which was chaired by um, uh, an eminent person from the industry, but an early industry services interface will enable moving beyond the technical aspects to application platforms and for domestic manufacturing to leapfrog. The promotion of dual-use technology must be consciously done because <coughs> uh, this is a sector where the requirements uh, will keep changing in terms of the complexities, but not necessarily in numbers. So we must, in this sector, also look at identifying the products that will get phased out over a period of time and the newer products that have to be brought in. No, innovation and startups through a joint mechanism of the services under the CDS to identify key technologies for operational requirements with DRDO and defense production, who should be mandated to bring manufacturing capacity and technology together, should become a key focus area. Uh, it, it was mentioned by General uh, Mr. Shukla, <coughs> that defense diplomacy must move beyond interoperability and procurement to support defense production. This has to be made into a two-way street. Formal mechanisms with countries like the US, France, and Israel have to be uh, sort of, you know, they need to be pushed, and I wish uh, Sanjay Jaju was here because he's driving this in the ministry. IPRs and government regulations cannot be obstacles in identifying and implementing specific projects in defined time frames. At the DTTI in 2019, we had agreed to do 10 projects annually, but we need to pursue this with some of the other countries as well. The <coughs> Effort should be to enthuse private industry and the startup community to work in the defense sector. And we must work towards actualization of the policy changes through facilitative mechanisms. I think you know, both government and the armed forces must design a more approachable interface, uh, which will uh, encourage in this to happen. It's often very difficult, and I have been part of the system, so. I know that it, it actually becomes difficult for, for people to approach uh, us in government, but I think we need to be more uh, active in outreach programs to enable this. And I'm happy to say that it has actually started, but it needs to be pushed. The <coughs> we should not just look at aviation, uh, although we are talking about aviation and and, and the ANDs, AND sector here, but we should also identify this for shipbuilding and for the army as well. So 
we have to look at what are the opportunities. The corporatization of the OFBs, Ordnance Factory Boards, uh, is also an opportunity to, to consider having joint ventures with domestic and foreign OEMs. In the previous session, we, we heard Mr. Patil from LNT say that uh, uh, he finds that the new policy now offers a more level playing field uh, for both industry uh, from the private sector as well as from the government sector. <coughs> so the disinvestment of DPSUs must also enable the DPSUs themselves to move in, into the direction of having more JVs with uh, the agencies that uh, you know, can be associated with the process. Finally, I think uh, we uh, in government must send the right message. Uh, Self-reliance and indigenous manufacturing and collaboration need not necessarily be in, in conflict. Private sector and DPSUs and the OFB must work in tandem with industry. And R&D in the private sector and with academia can be associated with the scientists of DRDO and with the ultimate users, which are the services. In conclusion, I would only say that defense R&D to production is a journey that needs to be shortened. The armed forces must lead as it is they who shape the GSQRs and undertake the trials and testing. And to strategize for future conflicts, perhaps a vision document for the A&D sector uh, to chart a roadmap uh, would be a good way forward and a platform of industry and OEMs handheld by government along with industry associations must be activated. I think it's only then that the buzz that gets generated by events like Aero India will resonate with the strategic uh, imperatives of national defense. So with that, uh, I hope I have been able to, to touch upon you know, some of the issues that I think are important for the strategy part of it. And thank you very much. Let me now invite uh, Air Marshal Anil Khosla, uh, the former Vice Chief of the uh, Indian Air Force, to speak about a very interesting topic, the 22nd century battle scenario. Thank you, Toby, and thank you, Synergia Foundation, for giving me this opportunity, first, to share a few views about a uh, very interesting subject, and secondly, sharing space with such a uh, distinguished panel. Well, uh, General Shukla has said everything what I wanted to say, and uh, being a night watchman, uh, I think uh, that is one of the advantages that, uh, but I'm very happy that at least the Army and the Indian Air Force are talking the same language. Uh, he started and he said that the cricket, he gave a parallel between the cricket and warfare. I fully agree with him. I find there are three similarities between cricket and the war. The first, the evolution, you know, from test match to ODI to uh, 2020 format. Similarly, the wars have been from world war to local wars and to skirmishes now. The moral of the story is the run rate is very high now. The wars which are taking place are very short, swift, and very intense. The second similar, uh, similarity I find is that cricket used to be a gentleman's game. I remember in old times when the batsman was out, he used to just walk off. He did not wait for the third umpire. Uh, now we find you know, all sort of things, uh, bowlers, bowling all sort of bowls, you know, psychological warfare, fighting on the, this thing. So similarly in the war also, earlier days when the people used to go up in the evening, the opposing parties used to sit down and have a drink together. Now, you know, the realm of no war, no peace, you know, asymmetric warfare and gray zone and uh, all sort of things which have come in. Third thing I find is technology. You know, you watch the cricket matches these days. So much of technology has come in. Those uh, cameras buzzing around all over, the analysis, analysis carrying out. Uh, I mean, third umpire, 
so much of technology. Similarly, in the war also, it has become technology intensive. So I find these three similarities between the, this thing. So I will not go into the details of what the war scenario will look like. I will just tag a few issues. The general has done a very good job of painting the canvas of what the future war will be. Although Toby told me to cover 22nd century war, I don't think I can crystal gauge that much ahead. So I'll talk about the near future only. So to just to sum it up or to tag it, first is the we have to be ready for all sort of spectrum, from conventional to conventional to nuclear. We have to be ready for multi-domain warfare, land, sea, cyber, space, air, all sort of domains. We have to be ready for asymmetric, non-traditional, gray zone, uh, piracy, you know, all sort of uh, threats. We have to innovate and think out of the box so that we can have our strategies ready. We have most important to my mind, we need to harness technology in a big way we need to be self-reliant, as uh, uh, my predecessor said. Also, I feel it has to be a whole of government approach and it is not only Ministry of Defense or the Defense Services, it is encompassing whole of government approach as far as war fighting is concerned. The last point I need to, I want to stress upon is, it is not only having equipment, it needs to be looked into doctrine, the strategy, the tactics, the organizational structures, the HR adaptation, training, maintenance, logistics, I mean, the whole gambit of it. Okay, coming to the second part, as I said, the future warfare, the harnessing of technology is the most important, especially in the air warfare. Being former Air Force uh, officer, I think I'll not be doing justice in case I don't talk about air warfare more than the others. Uh, future technology, quantum, quantum technology, hypersonics, the general brought out, is going to change the warfare, absolutely. You know, the, although the standoff distances are large, but the distance time taken for the projectiles to reach the target will be much faster. So as a corollary to it, we'll have to have systems which can pick up the incoming projectiles at a farther range so that we can neutralize them. So the whole gambit of the defense and offense will change. Artificial intelligence, robotics, nanotechnology, UAVs, drones, swarms, these are the future of the warfare. And all in a networked environment. That is the most important. These are all dual use uh, technologies. The like general mentioned, I feel the Chinese model of civil military fusion is a very good, which is they're developing within five or six verticals. I'm not saying that we copy uh, verbatim from them. What we need to do is learn from them and maybe adapt good parts from it. And all these dual use technologies, which are progressing in India as far as civil domain is concerned, we need to bring it into the military domain as well. And as an offshoot, gain from it. So we need to have a suitable ecosystem supported by budgetary support. Ecosystem which will bring the users, the academia, the R&D organizations, and the industry, both civil as well as DPSUs, uh, together and working in unison. Okay, while we are on the subject of technology, there are certain projects which are already underway in, the, uh, in our uh, country as well as uh, in civil domain as well as in the military domain. I think we need to give impetus to this. I'll just highlight a few of them. One is hypersonic weapons. Second is surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Third is fifth to sixth generation aircraft. Transport aircraft for both civil and military use. Most important is engine technology. I don't think we can become Atmanirbhar unless we get the engine technology going. And engine technology, I don't only mean uh, on the fighter aircraft. I think engine technology is all encompassing into all sort of uh, platforms. AI-enabled autonomous systems, unmanned platforms, sensors and seekers, very important, metallurgy and composites, and most important, once again, we need to get into a realm of simulators and network solutions for simulation, training, as well as war gaming. This is very important because the platforms have become very expensive. The rate of operating these platforms has very become very uh, expensive. So we need to have a training system where our human resource is trained. And the best way to is, like the Americans are doing it with the LVC concept, that is a live virtual construct. That means where you have live sorties going on. If you take the air warfare, you have the virtually generated uh, missions as well as you have constructive where the system generated tracks are generated and you have large force engagements and a training going on at every level by this live virtual construct concept. I will be failing in my duty as an ex-former Air Force officer and also because the Aero India is related to the aviation industry at large. 
If not, if I don't summarize and tag what will be the future requirements of the Indian Air Force. Uh, I'll be speaking as an individual, uh, not on the behalf of Indian Air Force. Uh, if I have to give advice to Indian Air Force on how to do capability building, I feel uh, we should go by the rule that technology intensive, Air Force is technology intensive. So we need to go into getting cutting edge equipment and technology for the Indian Air Force in future. While saying this, a straight jacket approach to military accretion with force of force numeric calculus will not work. It will not find our solutions. So what we need to do is, we need to have a capability-based approach rather than platform-based approach. So we need to blend both kinetic and non-kinetic systems. We need to have a multidisciplinary approach. We need to integrate all sort of war fighting systems into one. Indian Air Force, as I said, the, the need is to infuse technology. But this capability build, building takes a long gestation period. So we need to act slightly faster than the pace with which you are going. Coming to the last part, as I said, if I have to summarize and if I have to tag various requirements of the Indian Air Force in future, the obvious ones are starting with the fighter aircraft strength. As you have seen, it is drawing down. We need to have arrest this tendency and maybe get back to our original authorized strength. And while doing this, we need to give importance to not only quantity, we need to give equal importance to the quality as well as there has to be an equal mix or balance between the quantity and the quality. We, as far as combat support aircraft are concerned, I'm referring to the AVAX, the indigenous as well as the procured ones, and air-to-air -air refueling aircraft, they need to be in larger numbers. Airlift heavy capability, we are quite OK, but we need to find a replacement between AN-32 and Avro aircraft of erstwhile, that is medium lift capability. Hepters have come in in a big way. Although all three services, there is a requirement of helicopters. We need to go indigenous way. I saw the air show in the morning, and it's heartening to see the LCH as well as LUH doing those uh, maneuvers outside. It was very heartening to see them. Unmanned platforms, I'm repeating again and again. This is the third time. I think this is the war of the future. All three services need these platforms of various capabilities, ability to carry various uh, plat uh, uh, payloads, and ability to do various tasks. Air defense, as I said, and as the hypersonic comes in, the whole concept will change. So layered defense, we need liquid sensors as well as weapons. And the spectrum deals from, I mean, is very wide, from ranging from ballistic missile defense to the close-in weapon systems. Weapons inventory is a very important thing. We need to, not only numbers in terms of quality, we need to go in for smart weapons, autonomous weapons, fire and forget, standoff with precision, and also we can engage multiple targets and maybe have the capability of search and destroy. I think that is the future of the uh, weapons which is uh, coming up. Survivability equipment and electronic warfare is another very important aspect, both offensive and defensive. Uh, there is a scope, a uh, lot of scope in the, this thing for training platforms. One I said was the LVC concept, whereas we also need a lot of uh, platforms of the aircraft for training. Uh, and network environment is very important, which is developing very fast, although all the three services we need to get together into a common network. We need to have a very secure network, and also we need to have a network which can talk to each other and network which can work in unison. I have not touched upon the cyber and the space. Obviously, they are very important, this thing. In addition, the last and most important is the protective infrastructure. We need to have infrastructure where we can house all these systems and equipment and a sort of a provide some protection. There are various ways. I'll not go into it. And the last and most important is the HR part, where we need to address the tactics and the training of the human resource. And I've already touched upon how to go about it, maybe go into automated wargaming and simulated systems. I think that about sums up the requirements of the Indian Air Force and also the future of the warfare, not 100 years ahead, I would say about 15 to 20 years ahead. Thank you very much once again.
let me now quickly invite uh, sport and leader Samir Joshi, retired, the CEO of New Space Research and Technologies. He would be speaking to us on penetration of future contested airspace. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I'll speak on a subject which has been touched uh, very vividly by Air Marshal Khosla and uh, General Shukla, which is dealing with penetration of contested airspace, specifically talking of uh, and understanding the anti-access and air uh, area denial strategies which adversaries apply, and what are the measures we can utilize to go forward. So ladies and gentlemen, contested airspace is a series of overlapping capabilities in multiple domains, sea, air, land, electronic warfare, cyber, and space. The only aim is to impose maximum attrition on the adversary's warfighting capability in a certain class, certain area. Now, why it has come across? Because the tenets of a long-term enjoyed benign environment, for especially for the air elements, has swiftly transformed into an unpermissive contested environment with major challenges and problems which are far more, uh, you know, far more problematic and have uh, evolved over a recent uh, set of conflicts. Desert Storm changed it all. Uh, the dismantling of the Iraqi infrastructure, air and land, so easily by a set force of uh, the allies was watched very keenly by the Chinese and the Russians uh, and also others. Uh, regional powers like Iran, Pakistan, who, who took this and got into motion something uh, in creating something, corridors, what they call anti-access and area denial. This is the adaptation of uh, what I'll be talking about today. And uh, towards this, what is anti-access? Anti-access basically is to reduce the deployment of the enemy forces into a theater, to reduce the speed of their deployment. At the same time, hold them as far away from you as possible, away from the locus or the center of gravity of the conflict. Uh, primarily, anti-axis affects movement inside a theater. What is area denial? It is the action. Once the enemy has reached into a certain area where he can affect you, the action of the adversary to reduce the maneuvering within that area, to reduce and impede his maneuvering, so as to still dominate when he's closer to you. Uh, Area denial, it affects the maneuver within a theater. So just to highlight, A to AD capability exists in all domains of warfare, adequately brought out today, and uh, exerts very cross-domain challenges. Uh, adversary capabilities uh, arise from different challenges again, and in many forms. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. It was very extensively covered. But one tenet, which is very, very advanced in terms of an A to AD capability, is an IADS, an Integrated Air Defense System. Uh, which constitutes uh, of the focal adversary capability. Now, it may be a layered system. It may be a mix of layered system with air defense systems, as well as airborne platforms. But the idea is, again, to hold the enemy as far away as possible, as well as reduce his movement towards you. And once he's inside your space, to prevent his maneuvering around. This is the bedrock of warfare, what is going to be seen at a very advanced level if it happens between bigger powers. And not only that, even through the local conflicts, uh, you know, highlights are already available. Uh, we have seen uh, Syria, we have seen Azerbaijan, Armenia. So these are partly been implemented. And of course, once we go on to technological evolutions like fourth and fifth generation aircraft, four plus generation adoption, more commoditization of these platforms at a level, a smaller country level like in Iran or a Pakistan, uh, we face the same scenario. But the more important message, what an A to AD, uh, philosophy set says that this is now being attained at a very local level, even by smaller nation, by near peer adversaries. And it is a very clear and present danger to all the conventional air as well as land philosophies, which have been preached over the years. Of course, A2A2 is not, of course, a new term. It has been always there. 
But the fact of the matter is, because the technology and the conops of advanced weapons supported by AI autonomy has gone up so dramatically, it is far, far more dangerous now. Other aspects which influence in AT, uh, the, uh, talking of the same uh, technology are, you know, the extended range air-to-air -air missiles as well as standoff weapons, which are available nearly to every country. I mean, we just have to walk through all the stalls in Aero India, and we can realize that each one of them is actually complementary to some very advanced cap uh, capability possessed by larger nations. Also, the evolution of ballistic missiles. I mean, MTCR does prevent certain ranges, but uh, you know, the Russian missiles against uh, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan used, uh, you know, Israeli-made LoRa's back against Armenia. I mean, it's all happening. Finally, we cannot forget they are ballistic missiles. They are the same technology which the superpowers, you know, aim to annihilate each other with. So that is the proliferation. It's right down to the grassroots level. This makes up with the various layers of an anti-axis and area denial. Uh, I'll just give you an example. I'm sorry, I've not been changing slides. <laughs> Listen, uh, so this is basically, again, covering the anti-axis and area denial. If you see the anti-axis threat is to keep, it, um, keep him away and not let the adversary come closer to you, also the area denial is once he's there, you have enough firepower to actually control his axis and maneuver in, uh, very close to your own territory. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you a classic example how China is beautifully implemented this strategy. What it has done by the nine dash line, it has moved forward its own borders about 500 kilometers and 1,000 kilometers away from the mainland. We all realize the economic and geostrategic advantage of the South China Sea uh, to China. It is all part of a strategic and national aim which it's trying to implement in gross violation of a lot of international treaties. At the same time, what it considers that this is a necessity borne by similar capabilities which you know, countries like the US uh, primarily can you know, operate in a particular theater, bring upon them. If you see, very, if you see the nine dash line, the capability employed by various assets which they have positioned all across the various islands, they can dominate that. I mean, even powers like US have problems going through FONOPS operation by naval assets. Their platforms, again, are buzzed by you know, Chinese platforms. Similarly, the Russians do the same in Black Sea, in the uh, you know, other areas. But the, it's, it's not only that. It is the same issue which countries like Iran are also starting to employ. I mean, US drones are shot down by Iranians when they come close. Iranian boats, they uh, pinprick US carrier battle groups. Uh, these are layers of you know, defensive capabilities which have been put over over, and it will take a lot of time to actually dismantle them. So how do you do that? Fundamentally, A to AD can be dismantled in two ways. One is an inside out uh, based uh, capability and one is from the outside in. So inside out is a more of a technology intensive capability where you, ha you have a very short war, but you use very high technology weapons as well as systems of systems. Similarly, the outside in potentially is more a lengthy approach. It you know, dismantles layer by layer, more of a conventional warfare approach, more like it's been happened you know, so many years, uh, you know, since so many years across. So we see that the inside out approach is more logical and feasible method for countering the A to AD. Now, what are these elements of the inside out? They have to be dispersed, resilient, and the strategy con ops should be in place. Uh, if you start from the top, you need to have space assets, which give you ISR, communication, early warning, and a plethora of other tasks. Something new which has come in the last about uh, 15 years is stratospheric ISR, ballistic missile defense, and communication relay platforms. Uh, of course, all this supported by platforms like aerial refuelers, stand-up strike platforms, uh, go down to undersea attack capability, air penetration uh, munition. When you actually are operating inside the AD zone, you require penetrating stealth assets and EW expendables as well as you know, uh, the big uh, next generation jammers. The idea is that a US carrier group and the small elements, what it has, is a very classic example of what all technologies one should have nationally to cater to you know, future operations in the contested space. Ladies and gentlemen, in Doklam in 2017, 
India had a very good hand. The Indian Army was poised. We had good fighter assets in the area. Uh, the Chinese deployed an, a, a, a surface-to-air missile called the HQ-9. The idea was to prevent the Indian domination, the Indian airspace domination, towards, uh, you know, uh, from the Chumba Valley, which is coming straight down. But the fact of the matter is, they wanted to dominate right up to Chicken Necks. It has a good range of 150 to 200 kilometers. It definitely got our own aerial assets, you know, our commanders thinking, how do we negotiate this problem? So this is, a, this is a simple example how certain things, how simple weapons can change the scenario, how, how CONOPS can be implemented using technologies which will make a difference. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'll just give you an example what is actually happening, uh, what in India can happen. Uh, we'll just take an example of what's presented in the HAL stall, something called the Combat Air Teaming System. Uh, for all those of you wondering why HL is doing something, it's not, I mean, there is a method in the madness. It has been designed specifically on the end users, you know, discussions. The idea is, again, you need a system of systems approach on going through the adversarial capabilities of China and our Western neighbor, as well as whatever we face in the future. Towards this, if you see, uh, there is a plethora of platforms. There is a high altitude stratospheric platform, extreme to the right, the CATS Infinity. Then you have a hail platform, high altitude, long endurance. Then there is a max fighter, which is controlling a lot of manned assets. Uh, this is towards man and man teaming. A, a necessity, a necessary te tenet of uh, air warfare in the coming decade towards command of skies and contested airspace. All this is supported by a, a plethora of unmanned platforms, which are, and, uh, which are acting standalone or in a swarm. Ladies and gentlemen, the idea is to saturate enemy defenses enemy core uh, uh, early warning defenses specifically to take them out through a group of standalone uh, strike weapons and a group of swarm UAVs. I think it is very clearly unfolding in the effort what probably HL is showcasing. I think it is clearly unfolding in the way Indian Air Force is planning to take on, you know, to expand its operation. We in India now realize the clear and present danger of what Chinese, you know, A280 capability is presented in the Tar region. Similarly, smaller nations around us are also getting the same capability. If we don't go forward in this systems of systems approach, now this is just talking of the Air Force, I think the same is applicable to the Army, land forces. I mean, look at the way the Azerbaijanis took out the Armenian tanks, B vehicles, and other assets. If you don't invest in simple technologies, you don't invest in a simple thing like active protection system in a T-90 tank, it's not going to last long. You have to counter that push. But the fact of the matter is, proliferation of a large number of unmanned platforms in a variety of roles is making penetration of layered air defenses possible. Of course, Armenia Azerbaijan may not be that classic example uh, of uh, you know, an A280, but uh, facets were definitely seen there. So just to conclude, uh, this is something, you know, the way cats can actually operate. I just uh, you know, utilize my own bronze to get it there. But the fact of the matter is, look at these bubbles around. How do you go past? If you see the man platform is just maintaining on the edge of the bubble, we have to reduce that attrition to that fighter pilot or a group of fighter pilots, a group of strike package. We have to impose maximum penalty on the adversary. And all this is coming way in only through a systems of systems approach. That is the inside out approach to take out an A to AD comp. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I finished. Uh, this was just to tell you that it's not only that we recognize the potency of such capabilities, such philosophies, which are going to be there for the next two decades. It is also that the Indian Air Force, the industry is alive to these problems, and we have started to work towards it. And uh, hopefully, we would be able to cover the length and breadth of the same. Thank you. We have, uh, in the interests of time, we have one final speaker, uh, Sanjay Mitra, and uh, uh, we'll just uh, pass him on onto our screen. Um, shall I start, Toby? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Toby, for this kind invite. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on the same panel as General Shukla, and Marshal Kosla, Subhash Chandra, and uh, Commander Joshi. Uh, I'll just uh, do a quick job. I could not agree more with General Shukla that predicting the future of conflicts is very tricky. 
I remember, I remember seeing a quote by Robert Gates, the former Defense Secretary of the US. It said that when it comes to predicting the nature and location of our next military engagement, our record has been perfect. We've never once got it right, which I quite liked. Uh, all through 2020, first half, no think tank, no expert foresaw the India-China standoff. Um, so prediction is very difficult. So I'll stick to, I'm, I was never very good at predicting, I'll stick to the medium term and that too in the South Asian context. Um, I think in the medium term, because everybody is focused on COVID, post-COVID reconstruction, the possibility of state-on-state -state conflict in this region is very remote. Uh, but terror, jihad, proxy war will continue and presumably will continue with the same degree of intensity. Uh, Last year, while speaking at your one of uh, in 2019, when uh, I had an opportunity to speak here, I discounted similarly the prospects of a state-on-state -state war. The question is, do the recent developments to our north change it? In my opinion, they don't. And I agree with our external affairs minister that it was a reaction to our somewhat unexpected completion of the DSDBO road and the threat that it poses to the CPEC and to the Tibet infrastructure. Uh, there is also school of thought. It's probably a reaction to our domestic rhetoric on um, POK and on Aksai Chin that is contested. I believe that future reaction should be expected as in when we develop our border infrastructure. Whether it's the second access to DBO or strategic roads in Arunachal Pradesh or building our capabilities in the islands to project power into the Malacca Straits and the Krajist Mast. I think it's it's there, we should be prepared, at least in the near term, for uh, similar you know, incidents. But by and large, because of our uh, respective powers and respective capability, probably short stop a full-scale conflict. I'm actually one with uh, the former US NSA McMaster on uh, trusting the revolution, tenets of revolution of military affairs too literally. The idea being the technologic, that it's a technological advantage would allow the military to solve complex strategic problems to the precise application of military force. I don't think we should get carried away by this uh, because uh, it's been proved wrong time and again, everywhere. If precise application of military force is a great solution, what exactly is happening in Afghanistan? Um, so, I mean, I'm not very really convinced, but you know, I'm not a military person or a military thinker, but it seems somewhat rational. It's difficult to disagree with the view that our ability to successfully prosecute future wars will depend on building a broad-based consensus, uh, not only within the government, as my speak previous speakers have said, but also within the nation, where internal fault lines and contradictions have been addressed, uh, probably more than building precision strike capability and information warfare or cyber domination. We'll have to basically grow faster economically and have a more robust economic base. In purely military terms, it might be best to fall on our traditional strength, our battle-tested solid leadership, and maybe selectively modernize frontline formation. In the next two to five years, given the emphasis on existing platform and our existing commitments, we want submarines, we want planes, we want tanks, we want guns. I don't think there's enough fiscal space, unless of course we double our defense spending in the near term of for advanced technologies and the kind of capabilities we're talking about. There is no cash. Um, of course, there can always be cash, but uh, this uh, we need to look at it. Um, I agree with General Shukla that regional hegemon, there can only be one in the region. But being a regional hegemon also comes with a cost. We just found out what happened in Sri Lanka or Nepal or Bangladesh for that matter. Um, information warfare, control of social media, again, I'm... Um, I'm a little uh, suspect whose media, whose control, whose warfare. It is still not clear to me. Uh, maybe, you know, we can think, talk further about it. Uh, too much emphasis on virtual war, actually, could lend itself to unpleasant surprises in the, on the messier field, that is the battlefield, where nothing is actually clear. Uh, reliance on, I'm not also very uh, optimistic about reliance on Quad and other formations. You look at the recent treaty between the EU and China on trade, and you look at the record of some of the P5 countries in arming China in the last decade. So in the Western world, business always rules over geopolitics. 
except the us which has been actually very scrupulous in maintaining you know various technological and export embargoes to the to china it should not become a case as this properly called in hindi bharat tum sangharsh karo hum tumhare sath hai that is you know you go ahead and fight and we are with you uh, us support may cost us big uh, we'll see as soon as the come on this business of s400 how big it actually can be um and um, I mean, the past experience says that any country that got too close to the U.S. in strategic terms end up ended up paying a very high cost. Um, there was a recent article in the Economist which said that younger Chinese are very patriotic, very sensitive about Taiwan, Tibet, and Xinjiang, and are completely convinced about their manifest destiny to be the world's top power in 2049. This flies somewhat counter to one dis one uh, strand of thought which said this is an army of little emperors. Uh, where one every soldier has six adults dependent on him or her, and they have no combat experience. They have no, you know, they have not faced faced actual combat in many many decades. There is also as there is a lot lot of truth in, uh, truth in that. But if the lat if the former be true, then the surest way to Chinese global domination is by putting down India very firmly, whether it is militarily or otherwise. This is probably the somewhat longer term thing. we'll have to be prepared for it and it will only be through faster economic growth and greater social co cohesiveness military power is there we should continue to build it um, but the, there's no getting away from national cohesiveness and from you know um, an overall sense of purpose so thank you very much and that's all i had to say lightning us on the future of conflicts and the way forward so uh, now we come to the end of the session i hope the takeaways from the seminar will benefit the participants and attendees i wish you all a very good health and a very good day thank you so much